Hello, God bless you. I welcome you to today's deliverance service. I am David Ibona, and today we are going to be breaking curses. I'm going to be breaking curses, and we will be praying together. I will also be praying for you. It is important that we pray together. The Bible says one will chase a thousand and two will chase ten thousand. So we see that our joint prayer is at least ten times more powerful than when we pray alone. And distance is no barrier in the spirit. So wherever you are, you are praying with me we are together in the presence of the lord and so we are praying in agreement i want us to look at certain scriptures and then we'll start praying there are curses that come upon a person not because of what that person did but because of the biological connection the person has to someone who, who actually was cursed, who got cursed. Now, we have generational curses, curses that move from one generation in a family to the other. You can move from great-grandparents to grandparents to parents and to children and to their own children. And you can recognize these generational curses as challenges that reoccur with each generation. It looks like a particular family has a challenge that keeps uh, running in their blood. It runs from generation to generation. Sometimes it's a particular sickness. Sometimes it's not a sickness. It's a character flaw. It could be womanizing. It could be alcoholism. It could be anger. It could be um, failure in business and career. It could be that there is a limitation in the family that they cannot rise above. An academic qualification that no one seems to, seems to be able to rise above it. Uh, it could be that there is a particular time that they die. Some people, it is, it's in the family that once they get to 50, they die. Or 50, 55. A particular age and they start dying. It could be that a particular family, they are promiscuous. The married and the single are promiscuous. It's a generational curse. And so, we have the authority to break these curses. Jesus Christ was made a curse for us so that blessings can come upon us. There are curses that are broken at the new birth. And there are curses that you have to exercise the authority that has been given to you in the name of Jesus to break them after you give your life to Christ. So some people say, well, Christians cannot be under a curse. Well, it's not true. The, bad, the body didn't get born again. It's the spirit. The spirit got born again, got reborn. The soul has to be renewed. Your mind has to be renewed by you putting in the word of God. Your flesh has to be subdued. So your flesh needs to be dealt with. And it is through your flesh that the enemy can afflict you. Because now you are a born again Christian. He has no right to afflict you with curses that were placed on you. Or that got to you through your biological uh, connections. So what happens is that you take authority. You exercise authority in the name of Jesus to break them. The Bible says in First Peter, I think first or second, Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2 verse 24. First Peter 2 24. The latter part of that verse says, by whose stripes you were healed. So the Bible says that we were healed by the stripes of Jesus, which is a past tense, meaning that we were healed, but do Christians fall sick? Yes. So when a Christian falls sick, what happens? Does that mean that, uh, that something is wrong with that person? No. 
The scripture says you were healed. So why are you sick? What do you do? If you fall sick, you now exercise the authority in the name of Jesus and command that sickness to leave because now the sickness has no right to dwell in you. It applies same to curses. If a family is under a curse, it will not stop members of the family from making heaven, but it will limit their productivity on earth because we operate on earth with our bodies. So if the body has a problem, it's going to uh, affect your productivity. So just as believers fall sick, so also believers can be afflicted by curses not they are making. It's the same way you deal with sickness, you deal with curses. You command it to leave. Now, there are curses that come by association. They come by your association. For example, a man may be married to a woman who, is, who comes from a cursed family or who is under a curse. Vice versa also. The woman can be married to a man who comes from a family or is himself cursed. So what happens in such a situation? The woman will find it harder. If she is the blessed one, she will find it harder to move forward in life, more difficult to make progress. If it's the man, he would find it more difficult to make progress. And you will notice that one side seems to be more, far more productive than the other. You could have a situation whereby the man is so productive, the woman is so unproductive, and it can go the other way. And this is where sometimes there's a problem. If the two of them have a joint account, the curse in one party would be able to attack the finances of the other party. This is what I mean. If, for example, the woman carries a curse, in her life that is against progress, financial progress or increase. If the man has a joint account, bank account with his wife, he is going to find it, he will find himself in a situation whereby his money is being spent on solving problems more than it should. Or he cannot show what he is doing with that money it happens both ways so when you notice that your wife or your husband is under a curse attacking him you need to advise that person to get that curse broken to break that curse and if the person will not listen to you it is advisable to dissociate your savings your finances from that person's you can have a separate bank account and then you'll be able to help your your spouse you can help you can assist but it will limit the curse affecting you and you also you will break you will command that curse if afflicting you to be broken you will ask the lord to dissociate you from the curse operating in the life of your spouse. You ask the Lord to dissociate you from that curse, to disconnect you from that curse. Because if you don't, you are going to start experiencing challenges. And if you don't take action early, you will be brought to your knees financially. You will become broke, bankrupt. There are many men today that are suffering and the, the society looks at them as lazy or unlucky but the truth is the problem is from the wife. And the woman will be the one lamenting to everybody how her husband is not doing so well. And sometimes it's the other way around. The problem is from the man. So there are people that carry curses. Either they come from a family that is under a curse or they themselves are cursed. And so they can cause affliction to their spouse because of the curse in their life. So what do you do? 
you ask the Lord to dissociate you, disconnect you from the cross operating in your spouse. And then you have crosses that come because of the things you have done, the sins you have committed, what you have exposed yourself to. You have the authority in the name of Jesus once you have repented. Once you have repented, you have the authority in the name of Jesus to break those curses. So let's look at examples, an example in the Bible. I'm going to start with generational curse. Let's look at Genesis chapter 35, verse 22. Where I'm going to start with generational curse. We'll deal with it, we'll break it, and then we'll move on. Genesis chapter 35, verse 22. This is about Reuben, the first son of Jacob. It says, And it came to pass when Israel, that's Jacob, Israel is the name that God gave him, and it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. Jacob's first son was lost in after his father's concubine. Imagine that. And he went and had sex with his father's concubine. And his father heard it. And when a son has sex with a woman the father has had sex with, it, is, it now ends the father's sexual relations with that person. Because father and son should not go to the same woman. It's in the Bible. The father and the son should not have sex with the same woman. Mother and daughter should not have sex with the same man. So by virtue of Reuben's action, he ended intimacy between his father and Bilhah. Then, look at what happened to him. In chapter 48, definitely Jacob was not happy with that. When Jacob or Israel was dying, when it was time for him to die, he called his sons together, his children, he called them together to bless them. And also... To curse. This is what he said about Reuben. Genesis chapter 48, verse 1 to 6. Genesis 48. Oh, sorry. I think I should go back. Let's look at what happened when. Just a moment, let me be very sure of this. Chapter 48. Okay, let's look at chapter 48 first of all. There's something I will show you later. In chapter 48 of Genesis, we see where Reuben's birthright as the first son was given to Joseph. Genesis chapter 48, verse 1 to 6. And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, your father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, your son Joseph comes to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon his bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said unto me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you and I will make of you a multitude of people. I will give this land to your seed after you for an everlasting possession. And now, look at this, and now, your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto you in the land of Egypt, before I came unto you in Egypt, are mine, as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. And the children which you give birth to after them shall be yours, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. 
Can you see this? Now, when you go to verse 21 of Genesis 48, verse 21 and 22, And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you, and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brethren, which I took out of the which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. The portion of the firstborn was a double portion. The first son was given twice what each other child was given. Now, Jacob was about to die, and then he gave to Joseph his 11th son the blessing that was supposed to be for Reuben. And so he told Joseph, your two sons that were born in Egypt, I adopt them as my own, as Reuben and Simeon. Notice he didn't say as Judah and Naphtali. He referred to Reuben as Reuben and Simeon, meaning that Joseph's children, the second son of Joseph, would be regarded as Jacob's first child. Ephraim was the second son of Joseph. Now, Jacob took Ephraim and placed, adopted him at the time of his death, adopted him as the first son. So by lineage, Ephraim became senior to Judah, senior to Naphtali, senior to Dan, his uncles. It was given to Ephraim, and Manasseh was taken as the second, as his second born. Jacob changed things before he died. So Ephraim now got the position of first son. Manasseh got the position of second son of their grandfather, to their grandfather. That was why he said to Joseph, I have given you one portion above your brethren. Jacob now became two in one tribe. Two tribes. Now, in chapter 49, in chapter 49, verse 1 to 4, after he has dealt with, he has established it, that the blessing of the firstborn has moved to Ephraim, has moved to Joseph in his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Just like the blessing of the firstborn was given to Jacob and not Esau. In chapter 49, this is describing what Reuben now had to go through. Chapter 49, verse 1 to 4. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you, befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear you sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel your father. Reuben, he begins with Reuben. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength. And the excellency of dignity. He is telling Reuben what Reuben was supposed to be. His might, the beginning of his strength, and the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. This was what Reuben for, for, for how will I put it now? This was what Reuben lost because of a few minutes of sexual pleasure. He lost might, the might of Jacob. He lost the beginning of the strength of Israel. He lost the excellency of dignity. He lost the excellency of power because of a few minutes of pleasure. Verse 4. Unstable as water. Now he's addressing Reuben by his current condition. Unstable as water, you shall not accept. Because you went up to your father's bed and defiled it. He went up to my couch. You see the statement. He says to Reuben, you went to your father's bed and defiled it. And then he now witnesses to God and to everyone around against Reuben. That was why he said, he went to my couch. You see, he's addressing a third party now. He said, he went to my couch. Israel witnessed against Reuben for what Reuben did. And so, unfortunately, the curse was not only upon Reuben, it was upon 
his children. It came upon his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren. The curse came upon the entire tribe of Reuben. And it was broken. That curse was broken by Moses, the man of God. It took Moses to recognize that there was a generational curse that had to be broken. Moses had to break the curse that was upon the tribe. Because apart from Reuben as an individual now becoming the least of his brethren, the least dignified, probably the least respected of his brethren, the least honored, his lineage became the least in the tri amongst the Israelites. Whenever population was done, the population census was done, the tribe of Reuben looked the least. It was usually at the bottom. When it came to might, to wealth, they were at the bottom of the ladder. Not that every uh, Reubenite was poor, but the poverty ratio in the tribe of Reuben was higher than the other tribes. This is what Moses did. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 1 to 6, I'm going to emphasize verse 1 and 6. But you can read in between on your own. Deuteronomy chapter 31, I will read verse 1 and 6. In verse 1 it says, And this is the blessing wherewith... Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Now Moses is coming in as a man of God. Not just as an individual, now as a man of God to lay a blessing upon the nation. Now he begins with the tribe of Reuben in verse 6. This is what he could do. He said, let Reuben live and not die. And let not his men be few. When you read the rest of this chapter, it is only the tribe of Reuben that does not get a blessing of advancement, but rather they get a blessing of deliverance. The others were blessed with expansion, increase, prosperity. Leadership was given to Judah. This, 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 the Bible says the scepter of leadership will not depart from Judah. So Moses was already blessing ahead of time that the tribe of Judah will be the tribe to produce leaders. We see only the tribe of Reuben got just deliverance. What Moses could do was to end the, the, the uh, early deaths to end the shrinking population, to end the poverty in the tribe of Reuben by saying, let Reuben live and not die because the tribe of Reuben was shrinking. Let Reuben live and not die and let not his men be few. He attacked death and he attacked the dwindling population. While others will have 15 children, the Rubenites will have five. That's an example. Shrinking population. So Moses ended the curse that was placed upon Reuben by his father. He had to deal with it. And so if you are coming from such a background where you have you are facing challenges that your parents your grandparents faced you know that it's a generational curse we are going to break those curses today and we are going to release blessings upon our lives you're going to release blessings upon your life to replace the generational curses blessings because here now moses by this blessing of deliverance release the tribe of Reuben to expand to grow and to live their days so they also got blessed they got blessed 
Now, I want you to pray right now. We're going to start the prayer session by giving God thanks. We are dealing with the generational cross, then we'll move to the other. Let's give God thanks for this day. Thank you for what he has done. Thank you for the word that you are hearing right now. Give him thanks that the time of deliverance has come upon, upon you. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Give him thanks right now. Give him thanks. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your protection. Thank you for your provision. Thank you we are alive. Thank you for frustrating the counsel of the enemy. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to hear your word, to receive your word. We are grateful in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hear our prayer. Deliver, save, heal, O oh God. Turn the hearts of many to you. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to confess your sins unto the Lord, asking Him for forgiveness. And if you know there is a particular sin that runs in your family, confess it unto the Lord. You may not have been the one who committed that sin, but confess it unto the Lord that there indeed is a sin in your family. And that you confess that it is a sin and you ask the Lord for mercy. Confess the sins you have committed unto Him. Now pray. Pray right now. Confess your sins unto Him. Ask Him for mercy. Ask Him for grace to keep you from committing that sin, to keep you from falling into that sin. Ask Him for grace. Ask Him for grace. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. You said in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us. Lord, have mercy. Forgive the loss, the anger, the bitterness, the foolishness. Forgive the rebellion. Forgive, Lord God, the sins of your people. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Cleanse our spirit, soul, and body. With the blood of Jesus, cleanse us of all iniquity. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now you are going to pray like this. In that you are going to rep you can repeat after me. We're going to break these curses. And first of all, if you are not born again, if you are not born again, if you are not a Christian, this is the time to be one now. So that you can enjoy the power of God's deliverance. Pray this prayer if you are not born again, so that you become a believer in Christ. Repeat after me, Lord God Almighty, I come to you, I repent of my sins, I ask for your forgiveness, I accept and confess your Son Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I repent this day. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Wash me clean with the blood of Jesus. Write my name in your book of life. Keep me holy and righteous till the day I meet you. I thank you, my Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You are born again. You are a child of God and from now on, the curses of the enemy have no legitimate right, no legitimate reason to be in your life. So everyone who is experiencing generational curses, I want you to pray. I think everyone should be able to do that. You, you may not even know. They're going to say, in the name of Jesus, just repeat after me, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over and against the powers of curses operating in my family, operating in the lineage of my ancestors. And I separate myself in the name of Jesus 
from the sins of my ancestors. In the name of Jesus, I separate myself from the consequences of the sins of my ancestors, from the failures of my ancestors. And I break in the name of Jesus all generational curses operating in my life all generational crosses operating in my lineage. The Bible says Jesus Christ was made a curse for me when he hung on the tree that I may receive the blessings that God has blessed me in Christ Jesus and so there is no right keep repeating after me there is no right for any curse to operate in my life and so every generational curse in in my life in my lineage is broken in Jesus name it is broken in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now, you don't need to repeat after me. I'm going to pray. In the name of Jesus, I break every generational curse in the lives of these ones. Curses of failure. Curses of lack. Curses of marital disappointment. Curses of frustration. Whatever that curse is, whether it's health, whatever it is, I break in Jesus' name. And I release them from the curses that have flowed from one generation to the other. In the mighty name of Jesus, I bind the strong man in their father's houses. I, in the houses of their fathers. I bind the strong man in the houses of their mothers. In the name of Jesus, they shall not operate in their lives. No evil powers. Cease to operate in the lives of him and her. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So we'll go to number two. I'm dealing with just three today. Three types of curses. Number two, curses by association. Remember I told you, if you are move having, if you are a close associate, or if you associate yourself with a cursed person, you will become affected by the curse in that person. God cursed the house of Ahab. You see, Jehoshaphat made a mistake by associating himself with the house of Ahab. And the Bible says that he had a business arrangement with Ahab's, I think Ahab's son. And that business failed. It was, I think they were to, uh, they made ships to go and get some goods and the ships capsized. And the prophet came and made it known to Jehoshaphat why that problem came that it was because he was associating with a man God had cursed so when you are doing business with someone that is under a curse it is going to look like you are under a curse you will experience challenges when you associate yourself with people who are cursed when I don't mean associate, I don't mean that you know them, you talk with them. But when you become closely associated with them, when you are doing things with them, when you have joint endeavors, you will notice challenges that are not usual in your life. You will notice strange challenges. It is because the people you have chosen to do business with or to do projects with are under a curse. And then we have the example of Naomi. There are, the cur there are people that come under a curse because of their spouse. As I explained earlier. When a spouse is cursed, it will affect the other one. Until that other, uh, until the husband or the wife <coughs> would pray, asking God to dissociate himself from the curse upon his spouse. 
That is if the, the, the spouse will not be serious to, allow, to break that curse. It is better the curse is broken. But if the spouse is not serious to break the curse, you dissociate yourself from that curse. By asking the Lord to separate you from the curse in that person's life. I said it before that that is the reason why sometimes you can have a husband doing very well, the wife not. The wife doing very well, the husband not. Something is wrong. It could be from the, it could be that one is under a curse. Either the husband or wife is under a curse from the, a generational curse or a curse direct on that person. And so when they marry, it now affects. That is why before you get married, don't just look at the individual, look at the the family the individual is coming from and the relationship that person has to that family. Let me put it this way. Someone could be coming from a family that are wicked, greedy, foolish, or whatever, promiscuous. If that person sees nothing wrong in his family, even if the person is nice, run for your life. If that person is coming from a family that has such traits, and the person is not, uh, is not happy with those traits, if the person recognizes that there's a problem in that family, and the person is actively praying against being like the rest of the family members, you know that you are dealing with someone serious. And there is a very strong likelihood that the curse in that person's family has either been broken from his or her life or will be broken shortly. So, if the person sees nothing wrong in where he's coming from or where she's coming from, you know that person has a, is, is a problem, you're wrong. If the person sees something wrong and is doing something about it to separate his or herself from his family, his family uh, curse, generational curse. You know that person is serious. Now, Naomi was married to a man. Naomi, in the book of Ruth, you go to the book of Ruth, in chapter 1, you see that she was married to a man and she had two sons for that man. The Bible says that there was famine in the land, in the land of Bethlehem. There was a famine, and her husband took her and his sons to the land of Moab. She was married to a man named Elimelech. Elimelech had two sons, Chilion and Malon. Naomi was married to Elimelech. And when they went to Moab, they thought they were going to a better place. You see, it is not all the time you flee where you are because of trouble. Or it's not all the time there is trouble in the land you are in that you must run abroad. Not everybody will get their blessing abroad. Abraham, when there was famine in Canaan, he went to Egypt. And when the famine ended. He went back to Canaan. When there was famine in the land of Canaan in the, in the time of Isaac, the Bible says Isaac wanted to go to Egypt. And God told Isaac, don't go to Egypt. Stay where you are. I will bless you. So, don't just rush out. Hear from God. Naomi and her husband went to Moab. The Bible says when they got to Moab, the sons married there. One married Opa and another married Ruth. The Bible says that they dwelt there about 10 years. Within 10 years, Naomi lost her husband and lost her two sons and neither of them had a child. Isn't it odd that the husband had two sons his two sons were married, neither had children, and the three of them, the man and his two sons, died within a space of 10 years. 
something was wrong with that family. Because when Naomi decided to return, it was her daughters-in-law that were following her. Her daughters-in-law. Not her daughters-in-law and her grandchildren. When Naomi got to Bethlehem, she made a statement. Because I'm teaching from Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1. She made a statement when they welcomed her in Bethlehem. She said, I left full and I returned empty. No husband, no sons, no grandchildren. She would have entered empty and alone had it not been for Ruth's persistence. Ruth said, your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Where you die, I will die. Look at this. Ruth aligned herself with Naomi. It was a risky venture, but it proved profitable. If Naomi was cursed, Ruth would have become cursed by association. But we see here that Naomi was actually blessed. Her husband's side were the ones that had the challenge. Because when Naomi returned, events occurred that Ruth got married to a wealthy relative of Naomi's. And the same root that could not give birth to her previous husband gave birth to the grandfather of King David. Isn't that miraculous? She gave birth to the grandfather Obed of David. Obed gave birth to Jesse. Jesse gave birth to David. And so Ruth gave birth to children for Boaz. It shows that the blessed person in that marriage was Naomi and not her husband, Elimelech. But because she was married to Elimelech, she experienced disaster and sorrow. It was when, by virtue of the death of Elimelech, she was released from that curse by association, that the blessings that God had proposed for Naomi came into effect. She entered into her place in destiny. The Bible says she nursed Obed on her knees. She took care of the grandfather of King David. She became famous and blessed because now she, her destiny was fulfilled. So Ruth entered into blessing when she aligned herself with Naomi. Who are you aligning yourself with? If you are aligning yourself with someone who is carrying a curse, I want you right now to ask the Lord to disconnect you from that curse. If it is a business arrangement, withdraw from it. You know this person is horribly wicked, involved in evil things, and you can see that the Lord has that there are causes in that person's life withdraw from that person except you are ready to risk failure in business withdraw where you have to withdraw and where it is something you can't withdraw like a marriage you are going to pray right now lord disconnect me from the curses in the life of my spouse pray right now pray right now lord disconnect me pray Pray, talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Oh God. Where a spouse has refused to let go of curses in his or her life. I pray for the other spouse. For the, for, 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 yes, Lord, I pray for the other spouse. That, Lord, you will severe the flow of curses and 
frustrations and afflictions from the one who holds on to the curse to the one who is innocent. Lord, I pray that the husband will not call, will not suffer the curse because of the wife and the wife will not suffer the curse because of the husband. I pray that there shall be progress in that family. I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray that your blessings will be manifest. Your blessings will manifest in the life of the spouse that is innocent. Your blessings will manifest in the life of the other spouse. And it will help the family. I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray that you open the eyes of people to see where they are having problems. And to you, that you will show them, Lord, what to do to be set free. Thank you, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lastly, I'm going to deal with curses people have brought upon themselves. Reuben brought upon himself a curse by his lust. The Bible says the curse of God abides in the house of a thief. The Bible says the curse of God abides in the house of the wicked. The Bible says the curse of God is upon the one that the, the, the judgment of God will come upon the person that refuses to pay his workers or delays it unjustly. The curse of God is upon the proud. He resists the proud. So whatever it is you know that you have done that has brought a curse in your life, repent of it right now. Tattoos bring curse. Because those things you draw your body are representations of powers, of spirits. Just like the altar they, they was built in a way to represent the throne of God. When the Ark of Covenant was built to represent the, the throne of God, where the cherubims are. To bring in the presence of God. So also, all these things that you see, these uh, tattoos, these fetish things that are put around, these paintings that are occulted, they are designed to attract the spirits from hell to come into that place. They are built to attract them. So ask the Lord for forgiveness right now. And then I'm going to lead you in a prayer, breaking curses. Just repent of those sins. Repent of the sins of bitterness, hatred, unforgiveness. Repent of the sins of promiscuity, sexual immorality. They open doors. It doesn't mean that anytime you have sex in a sinful way, you are cursed. No. But it can open doors to curses. You don't know who you're having sex with, the kind of spirit behind that person. Pray right now. And now pray with me. You can repeat after me. In the name of Jesus. Lord, I repent of my sins. I repent of disobedience to your word. And I pray that every curse that has come upon me because of my disobedience, that every curse from your word that has come upon me by my disobedience, that Lord, you will lift those curses away. You will take away those curses and replace them with blessings. I pray in the name of Jesus. Keep repeating after me. 
and I take authority in the name of Jesus over every curse placed on me, placed on my family, placed on my finances, my health, by agents of Satan and Satan himself. And I break those curses in Jesus' name. For it is written, even the lawful captives shall be set free. And the prey of the mighty shall be delivered. Even the lawful captives shall be set free. And the prey of the mighty shall be delivered. Therefore, I stand on the word of God and in the authority of the name of Jesus Christ and I break the curses placed on me by Satan and his agents in the name of Jesus. And I proclaim the blessings of God upon my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'm going to pray for you. Father, I thank you for what you have done in the lives of my brethren. I pray that every curse that came upon them from your word because of their transgression and iniquity, that Lord, as they have repented, you will take those curses away. I pray that in your mercy, take the curses away and restore blessings unto their lives. Bless them, Lord, I pray. Increase them. Let your blessings and favor follow them in the name of Jesus. And I break the curses Satan placed upon them. The curses of that Satan's agents, which is warlocks, his agents placed upon them. Because of their disobedience to your word, they open themselves up to the enemy's attack. I break those curses in Jesus' name and I release them from this bondage in the mighty name of Jesus. I release them from this bondage in Jesus' name. You are free. You are free in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for delivering my brethren. Thank you for this time of deliverance. Thank you for this time of healing. From now on, good things will happen in their lives. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I bless you in the name of Jesus. You can contact me through WhatsApp, through Telegram. The number is plus 234-7033. Four three six eight. I'll call it again. WhatsApp and Telegram, or you can call me directly, whichever suits you. Plus two three four, which is the country code. Plus two three four, right? Seven zero three 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 four three six eight. Plus two three four seven zero three 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 four three six eight. Email. David Ibona Ministries at gmail.com. David Ibona Ministries at gmail.com. Ibona is spelled this way A I G B O N A. That is A I G B O N A. David Ibona Ministries at gmail.com. I'll bless you right now in the name of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You are blessed.